Welcome, everyone. My name is Beth Keen, and I'm CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to our fifth annual Teichholz Holocaust Remembrance Film Series. Last year, we held this series virtually for the first time and reached over 600 people from around the globe in the spirit of increasing access to these remarkable films and spreading the important lessons of the Holocaust beyond our local community, we are excited to once again offer the Teichholz Holocaust Remembrance Film Series virtually. This year's series is on German Holocaust films, exploring how German cinema has dealt with the complexities of the country's role during the Holocaust. For those of you who are not familiar with LA, we are the first and oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States founded by survivors. We were founded in 1961 uh, by Holocaust survivors who wanted to create a safe space um, to remember loved ones who had perished in the Holocaust and to also display their precious artifacts um, and to start educating young people about the important lessons of the Holocaust and what they had personally endured. Today, the museum continues to provide free Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States, and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founders to commemorate, educate, and inspire. I'm especially excited to share that the museum will officially reopen its doors after being closed since March of 2020. Um, we are officially reopening to the public this Saturday. Um, and we will be debuting the USC Shoah Foundation's Dimensions and Testimony program uh, featuring survivor Renee Firestone. Mm. The, the first film in the series is the original 1974 East German production of Jacob the Liar. Joining us for today's panel discussion about the film are Mariana Ivanova, John Keen, and Holly Levitsky. Full disclosure, John Keenan is my husband. Yes, we do have the same lab. Um, Mariana Ivanova is an associate professor of German film and media and the academic director of the DIFA Film Library at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her scholarship focuses on 20th and 21st century German and European cinemas and cultures, theories of trans, transit, national filmmaking and co-production, artistic networks, and cultural mediation. At the DIFA Film Library, she co-directs Summer Film Institutes and works within a vibrant team to support the research and teaching of East German cinema in the United States and around the globe. Dr. Holly Levitsky is the founder and director of Jewish Studies Program and Professor of English at Loyola, Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. She holds a BA and an MA in English Language and Literature from the University of Michigan and an MA in Comparative Literature and a PhD in English and American Literature from UC Irvine. Her work focuses primarily on the areas of American literature, Holocaust and Exile Studies. Most recently, she is the co-editor of two volumes, The Literature of Exile and Displacement, American Identity in a Time of Crisis, and Summer Haven, The Cats, The Holocaust, and The Literary Imagination. John Keane is the writer and director of the critically acclaimed documentary film, Swimming in Auschwitz, which serves, a, serves as the prequel to, the, to his film After Auschwitz, following the stories of six female Auschwitz survivors from different backgrounds. He was a visiting professor at Chapman University where he taught Holocaust through film and is the president of the school board for the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. Award-winning journalist and best-selling author Tom Teicholz will moderate the discussion. I wanted to thank Tom for bringing the idea for a film series to the museum many years ago, for your enthusiasm and commitment in curating the film series every year, and, and for lending us your time and insight as moderator. So thank you, Tom. Thank you also to the DIFA Film Library at the University of Massachusetts Amherst for the use of this and the Vendi Museum for their partnership. I also would like to thank the Consulate General of the Federal Republic of Germany, Los Angeles, for their generous sponsorship of this year's Teichholz Holocaust Remembrance Film Series, and the generous donors who have supported this series over the years, the Davidson Hooker Fund, YNS Nazarian Family Foundation, Rita and Leo Family Foundation, and the Rickenthal Foundation. 
Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's at no charge. If you're enjoying the programs, please cons consider supporting our work by becoming a member. And to learn more about our membership levels and benefits, you can go to our website, holocaustmuseumla.org. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Tom Teiholtz and our panelists. Thank you, Beth. Um, you, you said everything that I was going to say uh, <laughs> by way of introduction, but I will just add that um, the uh, film series, which is now in its fifth year, uh, is named uh, for my parents, Bruce and Eva Teiholtz, who were survivors. Um, my father was very involved in rescue activities and uh, speaking about the Holocaust. And uh, my mother before the war had been a film actress. Uh, so there's a sort of connection in uh, doing this uh, film series. But more than that, um, as a journalist and author and as a child of survivors, I've long been committed to finding ways to educate, inform and extend knowledge of the Holocaust to as many people as possible. And uh, I've long felt that film is one of the greatest forms of mass communication uh, with the greatest potential impact uh, consciously or unconsciously or subliminally uh, on all who watch films. So I wanna thank the Holocaust Museum LA for, um, for being the presenters of this uh, film series and for uh, embracing it. Um, you know, to have this series in Los Angeles, the world capital of film, uh, what better place to have it than in Los Angeles? And what better place in Los Angeles than at the Holocaust Museum LA, a museum started by survivors living in Los Angeles. Uh, so it's uh, particularly apt uh, that we hold it here uh, every year. And every year it's been growing, as Beth said uh, tonight, we are happy to have more than uh, 200 people who have signed up to watch the film or listen to the panel. And uh, that's really fantastic. And uh, it's really amazing. I also want to thank those foundations that have supported us uh, from the beginning, uh, the Richenthal Foundation, and in particular, its board members, David Richenthal, Scott Wetzler, Peter Graham, and David Bronston the YNS Nazarian Family Foundation, and in particular, Sharon Nazarian, uh, the uh, Rita and Leo Greenland Foundation, and Seth Greeley Greenland in particular, and the Davidson Hooker Foundation, and Edie Parker in particular. Uh, it's really wonderful. And of course, I would say to anyone watching that if you uh, have a family foundation or work for one or are associated with one and like the work that we're doing, please uh, consider uh, supporting this series. Uh, we would love it to be self-sustaining and uh, continuing and a integral part of the museum uh, every year going forward. Um, at the museum, I do wanna thank Beth Keen and Jordana Gessler and Harmony Barker for really doing the heavy lifting and putting this together and assembling our panels. Uh, our panelists, you've heard um, their wonderful credentials uh, yes, I will add that if John Keane's name seems familiar, it's probably because you saw it on a lot of lawns in Santa Monica. He is now the president of the Santa Monica uh, Malibu Unified School District um, and his two documentaries, Swimming in Auschwitz um, and After Auschwitz are really remarkable films that I highly recommend you watching. Um, uh, Dr. Holly Levitsky, has been our most loyal and faithful panelist uh, with us every year since the beginning. And uh, she has uh, not only teaches this uh, both as uh, film and literature um, and as Jewish studies, but uh, has written and researched uh, extensively uh, this uh, subject about uh, uh, Holocaust literature and film. And I wanna thank uh, Mariana Ivanova for joining us tonight. Uh, she is really our East German film expert, and we'll be really relying on her for a lot of the details that, you know, either I didn't know or Google did not afford me uh, the possibility of knowing. Uh, that being said, um, 
three weeks, three films tonight. Uh, we're discussing Jacob the Liar. Next Thursday on August 5th, we'll be doing AMA and Jaguar. And then on August 12th, we'll be doing Naked Among Wolves. Um, tonight's film, uh, Jacob the Liar, is uh, based on a novel by Yurik Becker, who wrote the screenplay. Um, and it's um, quite, uh, uh, the background to it is quite interesting. Uh, Becker um, was uh, born in 1937 in Poland. Um, as a child, he was in the Lodger Woods ghetto. Um, at age five, his, uh, he was deported with his mother to the Ravensbrück concentration camp. And um, then at a later date, they were um, deported to the Sachsenhausen camp. Uh, Becker's mother uh, died, um, uh, I believe of typhus uh, uh, at, at these camps. Uh, his father who was deported to Auschwitz um, survived and the two were reunited after the war and decided to live in East Berlin because they no longer wanted to go back to Poland. Uh, Becker uh, throughout his life said that he had no memory whatsoever of, of Lodger Woods or of the Holocaust at all, that he had a total memory loss, uh, which is quite interesting uh, uh, given that this uh, uh, story is what he chose to write. And uh, he became a screenwriter and uh, in East Germany. And in 1965, he wrote as an original screenplay, uh, Jacob the Liar. At the time, uh, East Germany chose not to put it into production because they uh, were not so interested in a film that was focused on Jewish suffering um, and the plight of Jews during the Holocaust. Uh, at that time, they had only really made one film that was uh, Holocaust related, which is actually Naked Among Wolves, which is the film that will be our third film in this series. And that film, which takes place at Buchenwald, uh, focuses on um, communist inmates, uh, um, some of whom are Jewish, but uh, not all of whom, in fact, few of whom are Jewish. So um, there's, it's quite an interesting uh, a background. And then Becker turned his screenplay into a novel. The novel was published and became an international sensation. And it won main, many, many international prizes, including the Heinrich Mann Prize. At that point, um, uh, the East German government decided it was a great subject for a film. And in fact, um, uh, Becker wrote a new screenplay and they had uh, Frank Beyer, who was uh, their, one of their top directors who uh, made it into the film that you've seen uh, tonight. Um, in many ways, it's an unusual film and certainly probably one that it's hard to imagine getting made if it had not been an international sensation. Um, we're gonna talk about its complexity and its tone. And at first I'm gonna direct the questions to individual panelists but then we'll sort of, uh, you know, anyone can answer. I'll have some general questions. And finally, uh, all of you, if you have questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A and we will try to address as many of them as we can, uh, as much as we're able to uh, work the technology and uh, read them. Um, so uh, let me begin by um, turning to you, uh, Mariana, and asking you to tell us a little bit about um, the difference between East German and West German uh, film regarding the Holocaust and uh, about DEFA and, um, and, and that, oh, excuse me, I forgot to say, thanks to the German consulate for sponsoring this series and thanks to the Vende a museum for sponsoring this. And I wanted to say um, 
guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, und willkommen und, und danke für Ihre Unterstützung. I've now discharged my uh, German obligations, and I turn to you, Mariana. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you, uh, Beth, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Harmony, and everybody at the Holocaust Museum in Los Angeles for showing the film, for inviting us on this panel, and me specifically. And um, thank you for this opportunity to talk about Frank Byers' 1974 film, Jacob the Liar, which stands in a long tradition of films that thematized uh, the German past, the shared German past in the Third Reich. Um, they thematized also um, the suffering and uh, the survival of Jewish people uh, during this hard time. Uh, and um, the film needs to be seen in a longer tradition that started with the very first post-war film in 1946. That was indeed a death of film because in the Soviet occupied uh, sector, it was, um, the Soviet administration was the first to allow again films to be made. So they licensed the very first film that was licensed was Wolfgang Staudt's film, The Murderers Are Among Us. And this film in fact um, centered or told the story of Susanne, a Holocaust survivor who is returning from a concentration camp. So it's significant that this is how the film opened and then developed the love story. But you're right, Tom, to think that the 1974 film to some extent brought a new tone and a new way of representing and addressing uh, a Jewish person in the Luge, in the Polish, um, or in a ghetto in Eastern Europe, as Jurek Becker repeatedly said, and Frank Bayer also insisted that this should be a ghetto that is not necessarily restricted to one town, but really should be seen as the fate of many people, uh, many Jewish people in the East. Uh, but in fact, there were many other films made before that. Um, we have in 1959, uh, the very first film that centers on the um, story of, um, or on the reality of uh, Jewish people being transported from Greece through Bulgaria to Auschwitz, stars. Uh, this is the film that brought my, that uh, raised my interest and um, uh, kind of made me really think through co-productions and why uh, the deaf film studios made co-productions with others. That was a film written by um, Angel Wagenstein, a Jewish Bulgarian director, um, author and screenwriter and director and thematizing the fate of, for the first time, the fate of um, Jewish people being transported through the Balkans to Auschwitz. So, uh, there were many other films made. I want to recommend at this point a very recent book from 19, from 2021. Elizabeth Ward wrote a book on East German cinema and the Holocaust, if you want to see all of the various films um, made on this topic. But why was this film made specifically in East Germany, right? This is the question that you're asking. And Jurek Becker being born in Poland and um, found by his father, um, uh, his father's name was uh, Mieczysław, and um, later on he was forced to change his name to Mordecha and Max in, in Germany. He was, um, Jurek Becker was found by his father um, right after the war in Sachsenhausen in an orphanage for Jewish uh, children who survived um, uh, the, um, the Shoah, uh, very um, starved, uh, sick, uh, and his father barely recognized him. He had to look at some uh, kind of um, um, sign on his skin to recognize his child because of how he looked like. Uh, his father settled in uh, East Berlin because he found there uh, a Jewish community returnees from the war, uh, but also because he believed in a anti-fascist state. Uh, he didn't want to go back to Poland where he experienced anti-Semitism. And he believed that he somewhat secured, secluded from, um, from anti-Semitism uh, in, in, in this point of time in East Berlin. And so Jurek Becker grew up there, went to Katy Kolwitz school and um, eventually began writing scripts for Defa. Uh, having studied philosophy in, um, in Humboldt University in East Germany, in East Berlin. And he always wanted to be a writer, but his, his path uh, took him to the Defo Film Studios because this was 
uh, maybe the first um, and somewhat easier step to, to tell his stories. Uh, he, like his father, was a storyteller and understood that the stories, the, the potential stories had in order to tell not only your own life story, but also to reflect on history. And um, though he repeatedly said in many interviews that he didn't have a memory of the Shoah and his experiences in the Luch ghetto and uh, Ravensbrück and Sachsenhausen, in, um, in Jacob the Liar, we see a lot of his memories resurrected on screen or resurrected on the page, as you said. And he started really conceptualizing this story in 1963, very early. Uh, as a very young um, author at DEF, uh, two years after the building of the Berlin Wall in 1961, the same year when he got married to a German woman and had two sons with her, he decided to return back to his um, story, the story of his father who owned a radio, as he said, in the Luch ghetto. And repeatedly in his life, his father said that owning this radio, listening to the news and spreading the rumors in the ghetto, as we know in many, the Warsaw ghetto, the Krakow ghetto, the Luch ghetto, these um, uh, stories and the news went from mouth to mouth that his father saw as the reason why they were de all deported in 1944 to the concentration camps. And when he registered with the allied forces in, um, after the war in Berlin, he would say that this is the reason why he, he and his family were deported and his uh, wife uh, were, did perish in the because they had Because they had a radio? Because they had a radio and somebody told on him that he had a radio. But uh, of course, the deportations had started long before 1944. And though he had a job, um, it was inevitable, as we see also in the film, uh, that uh, the ghettos would be um, people from the ghettos would be rounded let, up and let me stop you right there right there and we'll return to this but I wanted to ask you Holly about um, the subject matter and the tone of this particular story and how uh, even today it seems quite unique uh, in many ways um, both in its the characters and the and, and the outcomes and the, the narrative. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I also wanted to take a second to thank everybody. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me. It's a high point of my summer. Um, and thank you, Beth, um, for just having this whole thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I will defer to Mariana on anything having to do with the, the nationality of the film and to John with, uh, technical details as a filmmaker, but for me, there were probably four things that make this film unique. Um, the technical details, which I'll just talk about for a second, um, but also the depiction of the Nazis, uh, the visual narrative that's being told, and the theme, ultimately. Um, because the theme that we have here is, um, you know, it's more about a people's struggle to maintain their dignity and humanity amidst these hardships um, that they're suffering. And so the real enemy becomes sort of the situation and the circumstances they're in. Um, and that, first of all, is extremely unique. We don't have the big, you know, black and white, you know, dichotomy between good and bad and evil and everything else. Um, it's a subtle anti-Semitism. It doesn't hit you over the head right away. Um, but in terms of technical details, it's just music, it's monotonous. You know, it's not trying to, there's not a, a score there that's trying to also tell its story. Rather, it kind of imitates the monotony of the life of these characters. Um, so many medium and close shots. And again, I, I defer, I've just used up all my expertise on <laughs> shots. Um, but I know just as a viewer, let's say, um, that, that, that adds, especially so many close shots, both adds to um, this atmosphere of, of hopelessness and despair, but it also gives us specific insight into the characters. So when we're right there in the frame with them, you know, our gaze is, is on them and their gaze is on us, it's very intimate. And, you know, it creates, um, uh, what was it called, the imaginary witness, uh, making us feel so close to that person, despite, 
you know, this attempt at kind of lightness in this surreal world. And then the other technical detail that that stood out for me as being unique was um, was the use of flashback and dialogue to give us insight into these people's lives before the war. Um, and that's such a hard thing when you're teaching about the Holocaust, you know, it's often just like it starts at the Holocaust. But these people all had rich lives, professional lives, love lives, families. And so we get a sense of that, that, that these are real people with dimension and depth. And then the second thing is the depiction of Nazis. Again, it's not so black and white. Yes, they have power and they're, they're hardly in the movie. They're hardly in the movie. And they're kind of, there's a couple doofus Nazis and you don't, you don't see those very much. There's, you know, they're reasonable Nazis given the circumstances in a couple cases. Um, and then the visual narrative finally, which, which I think is probably since then, um, you know, we could think of other films that do this, maybe not as well. I, I haven't thought about it really fully, but um, you know, the, the visual, the visuals tell their own story and we get a lot of visuals. And I, you know, some people find the film a little too monotonous or too slow, too much visual. Um, but for me as a viewer, the uniqueness is that we are able to learn just from watching, from being shown rather than being told um, who the protagonist is, what his situation is, uh, what the power situation is, the power dichotomy, why Jacob needs to stay alive, you know, that he, he cares for his niece. And, um, and we get, you know, we understand their mood and their actions um, and their, the fact that they are in a constant state of fear without being hit over the head with it. Right, and, creates and great think, empathy for the characters. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so that's, how, that, I mean, that, that's my take on it. Yeah, John, I wanted to ask you before we uh, get into more technical discussions, you know, uh, uh, based on your two documentaries and, and the many, many, many hours you've spent with these remarkable uh, uh, women uh, who survived uh, Auschwitz, um, you know, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the importance or, you know, whether hope mattered you know the role that that we see that and and you know much to uh holly's comment i i think it's uh it is it's true that um you know there's no happy ending to this movie uh, uh but uh, on the other hand uh, it, it's right to say that the movie is about the struggle uh, for hope in this situation so i wanted you to talk a little bit about that based on the time you've spent with survivors. Sure, thanks, Tom. Um, I, I'll, I'll I'll take your 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 story of hope and and move it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think this film is is about hope, but it's not necessarily saying that hope is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. It is a battle. Um, do 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 you go to this side or that side? So I'll give you your preface to what you asked. We're seeing a ghetto. Um, we know we have documentation of spiritual resistance in ghettos. Uh, we know whether it was schools or whether it was uh, cabaret or whether it was art. We know how we tried to, Jews tried to keep normalcy in ghettos uh, versus camps where you had no control over your outcome. You only controlled your mindset, which is where it comes in. The key was create a purpose for living. If we can have a purpose for living, we can probably get from the next day to the next day that or the next minute to the next minute. So to me, that's what this film embraces. It's that idea of, can I create a purpose for living through hope? But the film is so beautifully done because you're, you have this other voice on your shoulder saying, is hope a good thing here? It's the sword of Damocles is the Holocaust that hangs over this whole film. The Holocaust is not in this film, but it's in every scene. Um, so to me, it's like, people are making a really valid argument for hope is a bad thing right now. This is a slow march to the, the, the trains are in like a third of the scenes you see cattle cars. It's the slow march to the cattle car, which is where the, the, the film ends. Um, so I found it, I, I found this one just fascinating from that point of view. And to, to Holly's point, 
Yes, I, I can see how people might say that's monotony. I'm going to push back on this one lovingly to those people and say it's a simple story, but it's so deep and rich within the simplicity. If you miss the first three minutes of this film, you have no idea what's going on because the entire plot is set in motion from the first three minutes. But then it's this beautiful examination of, of do I go to this side or that side, which was the story of the Holocaust? Do I go left or right? So I, I love the simplicity of this film and the depth. You're talking about the score. The score was simple, but it was perfect. And I'd love to hear Mariana talk. The lead actor, I can't imagine another actor playing this role. And yet he almost didn't get the job. Yeah. And in the opening scene, you don't know if this is a comedy or a tragedy. Uh, when his co coat gets, gets uh, trapped in the door, you know, it, it's like a slapstick routine. Tom, I laughed. I laughed. Yeah. The, the first 10 seconds of the film, I laughed out loud at the card. This, and, this and, film is know, not based on a true story. Maybe and, it is. And, and other than the dance of Genghis, Genghis Khan by Roman Gary, there are not a lot of uh, uh, works that can pull off this kind of tone in between the two. But let, let me tur turn over to you, Marianne. Talk about the, the casting and, uh, and how the film got actually got into the form we see it in. Indeed, both director Frank Bayer and Jurek Becker wanted to make the film as simple as possible. And they repeatedly in interviews said that they didn't want to portray the violence and glorify violence in the, in the way uh, we can see it in many war films about the Second World War, both made in the Soviet Union or elsewhere. Um, and um, they wanted to tell a human story and explicitly to redirect our focus to, to the Jewish characters, not the Nazis, not the perpetrators. I mean, this was their choice, whether it's good or bad or works or not, but the monotony that they um, let us feel through this film is definitely an intended uh, effect that they wanted us to have, because first of all, uh, as Jurek Becker and his father experienced them, life in ghetto, in the ghetto were, was very monotonous, gray. You see the scale, the color scales used in this film and Frank Bayer on purpose chose the Kodak Eastman color to represent the present in the film of the ghetto, the brownish, grayish, greenish colors that was contrasted very starkly with the East German film stock of Orvo. It was called the company that produced this over larger than, than life colors and um, hyper colors that were very often also used in children's films. So the audiences might have recognized the memory of a previous life as almost a fantasy, almost like a over, um, overly uh, portrayed memory. And of course the, the story of the sick princess was also shot in these colors on purpose uh, to emphasize Lina's, um, Lina's imagination of a different life perhaps, or what every child also dreams of, a fairy tale. Uh, but back to, to the question, which was um, about the, the actors and the um, uh, actor's choices. So once the novel, by the way, the film actually never made it in 1965 because there was a famous plenum um, just in the eve when the final film script was submitted to DEFA in December 1965, 15th of December 1965. And this plenum uh, did not reject the film. Uh, the film was actually approved and for eight months they thought they will make the film. What came into, um, um, into not making the film was actually the Polish partners who rejected and refused to, to present the show and the Holocaust on the film in this way. And then the director also was sent to uh, work uh, at, for two years in, in the theater uh, in Dresden. So anyway, um, once the film, the novel was super successful in 1969 and translated into many languages, uh, the studio was approached, or um, the author, Jurek Becker was approached also by West German partners. And there was a famous, um, um, uh, the um, actor, German actor, Heinz Rühmann, who really wanted the role, but he had played in many Nazi films. So Frank Bayer really jumped back uh, and on, on board with Jurek Becker and they res resurrected their plan from 1963, 10 years later to make this film as an East German film. 
uh, they thought through many uh, various um, actors who could play um, um, who could play um, 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 Jacob. Jacob, sorry, I'm blanking. So Kowalski, the actor who played Kowalski, actually, uh, Gishonik was one of the contenders. But um, Frank Bay really thought that this should be not a French actor, as there were some, if Montan wanted to play the role too, by the way, not wow. a West German actor. This should have been an actor from the East. And so he chose Vlastimil Brodsky, who was one of the actors in Frank Bayer's student films. He studied in Prague, and once the Polish partners were not anymore in the game, if you noticed in the credits, the Czechoslovak partners actually was, were able to support Defa, the East Germans in making this film. They considered it equally important. And the film was widely distributed in Eastern Europe as well at the time, in addition to um, the London Film Festival, Japan, the US, as you saw, um, it was nominated, the film was nominated in 1977 for an Academy Award. So it received an inc incredible international reception. Yeah. And I agree with you, John, that unfortunately, Robin Williams does not make the same character in 1999 as Vlastimil Brodsky. Just he's so authentic and original and but, reminds me a lot of the other Central European movies. And, and, the and you know, he's somewhat of a slumil, to use the uh, 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 right word. He uh, you know, he, he's not, I mean, to some extent, and, and I'm interested in your, in your, all your reactions to this, in some sense, you know, the world of the ghetto is an upside down world. It's a world in which, you know, the Schlemiel is called upon to be courageous, where, you know, even if it's, if it's 7.30 p.m. and the Nazi tells you it's eight after eight o'clock, that's what it is. Um, you know, uh, everything is sort of opposite of, uh, uh, of uh, what you, and, and I found it very touching when um, the, um, another example of hope is the romantic couple, right? Misha and Rosa. But when she misses the other, the person that he shared the apartment with, when he's no longer there, that was very affecting, I thought. Very, you know, really made you get the randomness um, because it's not a world in the ghetto of logic. That that's also, and the scene where the where Rosa's father smashes the the uh, radio was a you know was a very interesting scene. So. You know, uh, it, it, John, you have something. Well, I would say, but that's that's the, that's the hope. That's the hope argument. Right. Just Misha and Rosa. Misha, he's gone. People leave all the time. It's this practical, the reality of the ghetto. Whereas Rosa is this beautiful soul who uh, just wants to spend a moment mourning the loss of this individual who she's never met. She's only heard. Mm -hmm. It's that that balance of of. And even 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 Jacob, it, it, everybody is dealing with that balance. I mean, let's not forget that he slaps his niece. Yes, he slaps his niece in an act of violence, and yet the next time they're together, it's as if nothing has happened. So again, like you're saying, Tom, everything is upside down. This is a world that is just haunted by the specter of death, and everybody snapped, yeah. and then. I, I love that counterplay of the, of the good evil within everything happening. Yeah, you know, you know, uh, Tom, Tom, just to, yeah, just to, um, sorry. No, yeah, no. Just, just to respond to you, I think what you said about the carnival is, is a fascinating kind of framework here. Um, and it's, a, it's also a framework in a larger way for the Holocaust, which we know was a, a topsy-turvy universe. Everything was upside down, language, language was changed. Uh, John, as you pointed out, you know, the Schlemiel is the hero. Um, but the one thing about the carnival we know is that it's always temporary. The carnival isn't real life. The carnival is life turned upside down. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful metaphor. I mean, I really hadn't thought about it until you said it, but it's really a wonderful metaphor uh, to think about what life must have been like. Um, and it it's so hard, even impossible, to try to imagine 
all of us now what it was like then for them, or even a filmmaker, artist, a producer of culture of any sort to try to reimagine that. And yet the idea of the carnival allows us to understand that it was a world without reason, without logic. And in the film, we're shown absolutely how temporary it is. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention that Yurik Becker actually taught um, frequently in the United States. He taught at Oberlin, Cornell, Washington University in St. Louis, and the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, which, which is which I found kind of surprising, um, but I was wondering whether um, Holly uh, uh, Jacob the Liar is a novel that you teach or that you um, see being taught in uh, Jewish studies or Holocaust studies courses in the U.S. Uh, presently. Um, it's a good question, Tom. I haven't read the novel. I, um, I've never seen it on a syllabus. Yeah, or, or at a conference. Never heard it talked about, spoken about at a conference that I've been to, but that doesn't yeah. mean it hasn't been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was into that. And then similarly, Mariana, oh, before I get to John, Mariana, I was wondering whether, what was the impact of the novel and the uh, film in East Germany did it open doors? Did it change the films that came after? And then, John, w w I wanted to then go back to something you said before we went on the air about the American version and the context. But first, Marianne, t tell me about the impact of this mm -hmm. movie. Sure, I just want to tackle on this question about teaching the novel. I have actually talked a lot the novel and the film together and even once attempted to teach it together with the Hollywood version. Uh, so I do believe that in German studies in political science and history, maybe German studies and history more people um, do teach uh, a lot the novel in conjunction with the film, especially because the novel has two endings, two different endings. I was going to bring that up. Right, so maybe we can talk about this later, but what we see in the film is the more realistic ending in the novel. And um, the other ending involving the Red Army was repeatedly um, not accepted by the deaf of filmmakers because they said uh, the Red Army never liberated a ghetto. They liberated the concentration camp, Sachsenhausen and Ravensbrück, but not a ghetto. So they tried to stay historically uh, true uh, and truth and li lie is another topic that we can discuss in conjunction with this film. The blurred boundaries, who lies, uh, in the and and um, I feel also what is really important to point out about this film is that um, Jacob is forced to lie, though he is the the one suffering uh, in this situation as opposed to the Nazi guards who live in their own truth and are reconfirmed. To, by way of creating contrast here in this kind of false truth, um, uh, while hope emerges from the lies, hope emerges from the search uh, for humor, for survival, for understanding of life as it is. The impact of the film initially was not very big because it, it was a co-production with East German television and it in fact premiered on East German television uh, very untimely, um, uh, in, uh, in, on, a, on a Christmas Eve, uh, I think it got a lot of viewership, but then the um, movie theater premiere was impacted by that and only about 44,000 people saw it. Another theory here, why so few people initially saw the film is because uh, many people thought it's a traditional anti-fascist narrative. And here I come to your question, did the film change how people in East Germany and in Central and Eastern Europe thought about the Shoah? Yes, it did to, to a large extent in the sense that a lot of later films in the 80s, like The Actress and other films, continued to center on Jewish characters and uh, increasingly eliminated or kind of marginalized the traditional anti-fascist slash communist resistance fighter and really try to tell a story of a Jewish person. I think that was revolutionary to some extent. Again, many of these films were made in state-run uh, film studios, so they were not the same as the films made in the West uh, and in Hollywood, nothing like the Schindler's List immediately. And yet I do believe that somebody like Steven Spielberg had watched 
The Pianist or other films um, later. And uh, Roland Polanski's work also can be brought in here as somebody who also came from Central Europe. But yes, um, the short answer here is yes, in various ways, this film changed the way stories were told on screen. Yeah, quick, quick, quick follow up on that. In East Germany, though, did they sort of take the position that the Holocaust and the Nazi perpetrators were essentially West Germans, that they being communists were not or had never been Nazis, and so they could make these movies? So this is the black and white way to see it. I can recommend here a very good biography of Jurek Becker where you can see how choices were made and why and who Jurek Becker became in East Germany by uh, Sander Gilman. Oh, yes, yes. I read, I, read, I read a lot of it. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's Jurek Becker, A Life in Five Worlds, which gives you a lot of insight of both existing anti-Semitism and endorsement of returnees, remigrants from South America, the US, Mexico, right, um, uh, and the Soviet Union who were Jewish. And a lot of them embraced, many were assimilated Jewish people, some were religious Jewish people. And they, uh, for the most part, many of them embraced uh, anti-fascism and communism as their ideology. But Max Becker, the father of Jurek Becker, for instance, was never political. And that's interesting why he chose to stay in East Berlin. Uh, and I believe this biography can give you a lot of the insight of Jewish life in East Germany at the time and diversify a little bit the narrative that the guilt and the fault was always pushed to the West. Uh, we see, in fact, on screen, especially with the films about Holocaust stories, stories set in the Third Reich, that there is a subtle narrative of understanding and trying to make these films relatable for Germans. I don't know if this project is right or not, of course. But what we still see in these films is that the perpetrators are not confronted um, up front as much as we wished to see them or we would see them in a Holocaust film today. And there is um, the viewers remain to some extent an onlooker, a kind of a bystander, which in itself can also invite a reflection for somebody who was German at the time of why is that? Why you're not able to identify and relate to this personal screen? But uh, this identification is not sought after. Right. Uh, I want to encourage everyone who's watching to uh, send in questions if you have them. Uh, we'll, we'll try and get to them in a cup in a minute or two. Um, uh, I, I uh, wanted to mention, yes, the ending, uh, which uh, there was there's several different endings, one of which in which there's a voice that says that Jacob did not survive, but we're meant to think that someone who is telling the story did. Um, and then, as you said, there's the, there's the question of the Red Army, uh, um, which, which is, um, which in the film, I, I mean, I found that, you know, again, as John, you were pointing out, given what we've come to know about Jews and cattle cars, looking at the, at the scenery, uh, you know, it, it was quite a powerful ending uh, to end that way. Uh, what did you think, John, about that choice? It's interesting. The, the first thing I thought of is, wow, they have so much room inside that cattle car. Yeah. It's, it's the first thing I thought of. Um, and then I thought, wow, that, that window isn't covered up at all. <laughs> I, I, I was like, there's, it, but, but again, this film is not, okay. I come from documentary where documentary, you, you have to believe that it's real. Um, we present images that are based in fact, stories that are based in fact, as opposed to based on fact narrative films, which this film is not. This film is a fable. So now it goes, it goes into a different understanding. Um, but why I love this film is that the emotional life of this film is so real. And I, I felt it was so genuine to what that experience could, must have been. The, the, the weight that the characters have, yet they still have the, the joke with one another or how they interact with one another. They're all carrying this extra weight. Like they're carrying those hundred pound bags. They're all carrying weight constantly, but yet they still interact as if, 
you're the barber and the shop owner, the cafe owner, which is who they are, who Jacob and his friend are. Um, I'd like to just quickly, if I could, talk about this film's place um, as European cinema versus American cinema. Let's go back to 74, where this would have come out. America, four years later, we have the Holocaust miniseries, which we know created uh, a new type of a new type Changed of uh, everything yeah but reflection in germany as well specifically west germany so it's interesting how the two fables work but there's so much truth in jacob which is why i think it works so well um as opposed to these other fables like boy in the striped pajamas which i view as a dangerous film i, I think the stories told in that are so dangerous the tropes that are in there are manipulative i never was manipulated by jacob it was just, I mean, the scene that I'm going to remember is the one scene where he cuts the piece of bread. I don't even know what he put on it. It looked like it might have been like onion, but it was as if he was eating filet mignon and caviar. And, you know, I was like, oh my God, the beauty of that simple piece of bread with whatever he had, like he ate like a king that night and, and then he gets interrupted. I mean, how beautiful are the, these little moments. So even though this film is completely made up, I would teach this. And I would teach this in counterpoint to the American response, which came four years later with Holocaust, the miniseries. Um, and then I would definitely show 99 when Holocaust became the, you know, the, the cause celebre in film and any actor worth his weight wanted to win his Academy Award. And you, you're never gonna convince me that that's not why that, how that film got made, how it got remade. So I think it's an important film that should be taught. And I want to give credit to Marilyn Heron at Chapman because this was on our syllabus, but it was as an extra thing. It wasn't on the, not everybody had to see this film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me look, uh, uh, if we have uh, some questions here, um, uh, there are, some people are asking about the languages they spoke, uh, whether it was, would have been Yiddish, or Polish, uh, uh, you know, that, that makes me uh, an important point, which is that in this film, although we see a few um, uh, religious Jews or what we would look at as, as, as um, uh, uh, Haredi kind of looking Jews with beards and lo log hair, there's not, you know, we don't see that as part of their experience. We don't see them as religious and certainly in the flashbacks to the life of uh, Jacob as a cafe owner, restaurant owner, and of Kowalski as the barber. It, it, you know, uh, it, it's a completely assimilated uh, life, uh, drinking vodka, riding in carriages, uh, uh, dining out. So I thought it was uh, interesting that it was, it was as if the conditions in the ghetto were so um, uh, desaturated that it was desaturated of religion uh, as well. Uh, uh, what did you think, Holly? Well, I mean, it was desaturated of, of everything because everyone was just reduced to the Jewish star. I mean, that's how I felt in watching it. Coming um, and going on the front and the back. Right, right. So, I mean, honestly, it, it sh truly showed that everyone suffered. The elderly had to work in the, you know, cleaning in the streets. Children had to eat crumbs or starved. There was no distinction in class or age or, or sex. So I guess that's how I thought about it. I, I hadn't really, I hadn't really noticed that specific detail missing. Mm. I wanted to comment on the language as well. Uh, so, there are a few words of Yiddish, but in fact, Jurek Becker himself grew up with Polish and then what they called the Lager language, the concentration camp language, which was a mixture of Yiddish and a lot of German commands and like just this kind of despicable form of communication that stuck with him in his young age. And so I believe this is why the film never resorts back to Polish and it's, it is disturbing that the language continuously is the language of the perpetrators as well on some level, right? The viewers would not see Jewish people speaking any other language. While in other films I pointed out earlier to the 59, 1959 stars, they speak Ladino, 
the language of the, the Jewish people who lived on the Balkans in Greece and Bulgaria. And um, I thought that was very distinguished uh, feature of that film because it forced, and in that film we hear Bulgarian, German and Ladino, so it forces the audience to really reflect on the languages uh, spoken in various regions and um, specifically also by Jewish people. And so it brought out the culture more. But back to Jurek Becker, I do believe that his background is assimilated, coming from a very assimilated family. His father and his mother had um, Polish names, Annette, his mother, who later was renamed Chana or Hannah. They, um, at some point in interview, his father says that we were made in, or in a sense, they were forced to understand that their identity was Jewish or what their identity was reduced to Jewish through anti-Semitism that they experienced repeatedly year after year, day after day, hour after hour. And that probably is also a reason why Polish is not very prevalent in this film. And back to the image of the tree, this is how the novel starts with the narrator whom we never learn who is he or she talking about the privilege of seeing a tree that was not allowed in the ghetto and how, and then the symbolism of the tree of life, obviously a, also very important symbol in, in Judaism uh, and kind of the ending of the film is a reference to this metaphor of the tree, which is symbolic for life and death for coming out of the ghetto, but the last sentence of the script and of the novel, I believe, was they're taking us wherever they're taking us. Kind of this uncertainty, no direction, no destination, the journey does not, you don't arrive. And so I believe this is the contrast that is again established to the theme of hope, theme of survival and humor and encouragement. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So Tom, I, I, had, I had hope until I heard the whistle. The very last sound we hear in the film is the whistle. Mm. And I had hope. I, I, I still believe that maybe, maybe they're going to work, maybe. And then I heard the whistle and I'm like, there. I said, mm. maybe Misha and Rosa. And it yeah. depends if people survive that day of selection. Right. I said, they're right. all dead. Uh, I'm just going to give one more piece of uh, interesting trivia. Uh, uh, Becker discovered, uh, not surprisingly, that the uh, East German Stasi kept a secret service, kept a file on him uh, for many, many years. And when he was able to at get his file, he discovered uh, that they had uh, put on his file a code name for him. And uh, uh, the code name was Ligner, uh, Liar. L liar was his code name which is kind of, um, you know, gives us back and forth in every meaning, uh, referring to the book, the screenplay, the film, and what they thought about him or not. Uh, listen, uh, uh, this has been a great conversation. I'm gonna, uh, uh, if you, I'm gonna turn it over. If you have a concluding remark you'd like to say about the film, uh, uh, um, I will uh, ask you to do so. And uh, then I will thank you all uh, for participating today. Um, uh, Mariana, do you have a concluding comment about the, the film? Yes, and I wanna thank everybody who wrote in the chat and in the Q&A comments about teaching, about the languages, about the amazing music that is used in the film and the setting. Um, I want to reiterate Johnson Holly's uh, comments that this film is important even though it's made in 74 uh, for teaching, for viewing and for thinking through what it was there, but also what we, how we want to portray and to talk about the Holocaust today. I think this is a very important question in recent publications as well. Uh, who are the guardians of memory? Which memory and how does memory work? So all of these questions are raised in the film and I'm glad to see it used in conversations about the memory, witnessing truth and reality. Um, also important words in our um, conversations politically and otherwise today in the US. So thank you for inviting me. And if anybody wants to email us with more questions, um, please do. Uh, John? Oh, I'm, I'm not muted. So I'll say two quick things. One, this is the filmmaker hat going on right now. In terms of the language of the film, I'll, I'll do the quote. Sometimes a pipe is just a pipe. 
Um, mm. when, you're, when you're making a film for, for a particular audience, you put it in their language. Um, sometimes it's not thought of as like, oh, this is a decision I'm making for this artistic reason or this and that. No, sometimes I'm doing this in German because I'm playing it to a German audience. And if I make them read a film, it's not going to be as successful. So I, I, I don't know if it's that cynical, but we deal with that all the time in terms of what we show. Um, I will say one last thing, which is to me, the Holocaust will always be, um, uh, the Holocaust is about the final solution about the attempted eradication of European Jewry. Um, is this film about the final solution? No, not at all. Um, like we're saying, the role of Judaism, they are there because they are Jews. Every time they turn from every angle, we know they are Jews. We know that is why they are there. But you're saying that's not the point. There's a bigger, there's a bigger connection that this film makes. But I do think that this film um, is such a beautiful depiction of, of this little slice of life at this one time. That is an, it is an important film for Holocaust study. Holly. Yeah, I mean, my colleagues have said so many wise things. Um, I've been taking notes and, and it's been helping me think through this. And I think one thing for sure, echoing Mariana, is that it should be taught just because I, I haven't taught it or it hasn't, I haven't seen it on syllabus, uh, syllabi in Jewish studies or Holocaust literature doesn't mean it shouldn't be taught. Uh, Thinking about this film has really made me think about, uh, in particular, what what uh, what John said, that um, you know we we do need to have a purpose for living, and that hope can sometimes supply that for us, but it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, you know, the Holocaust it isn't about the Holocaust, but the Holocaust is in every frame. Again, I think to quote John here. And, um, and again, my thoughts about the carnival, it's the carnival until it's not. And by the end of this film, it's not. Yeah. Well, thank all of you, um, you know, uh, for, for really um, uh, broadening our, in, our no insight and knowledge about this film, which is a really um, a unique and uh, uh, film that I'm so happy we were able to, um, bring to all of you and to share with all of you. Um, I think it's tone, the performances, um, the way scenes are handled, everything about this film really makes it um, unique and really uh, worth seeing and worth si thinking about and worth discussing um, among uh, films and the fact that it was made in East Germany and is a German film, um, I think uh, adds to our knowledge. So with that, I thank all of you. Um, next week, we'll be doing Amy, Amy and Jaguar. Um, and so until then, uh, Auf Wiedersehen. Bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Good night. Good night. And remember the link is still alive till midnight. If you haven't watched the film, watch it until midnight tonight. And the museum said this talk has been recorded, so the museum will have a copy of this. And, you, and many of the stop. films, thanks, Holly. Thanks. For yep, me. many of the films Mariana mentioned you can watch on Canopy through your public library. And if you want to watch this film again, it, it's available on Canopy as well after your link expires. So again, thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.